Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are remembering and learning new information about the IWW, the International Workers of the World, or the Wobblies, with Ahmed White, author of the new book, Under the Iron Heel, The Wobblies and the Capitalist War on Radical Workers. Ahmed White, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this terrific book, which I've just read. I I associated the Wobblies with the great labor songs of the Little Red Songbook and Joe Hill, and in other words, general cheerfulness. But they arose out of unsustainable misery and were crushed. I take this to be the main focus of your book by police and prisons and lynch mobs and phony murder charges and hangings. Uh, so who were the Wobblies and what is their story? Well, you're right. Their story is is a complicated story, a story of, of perseverance and, and confidence and, and courage uh, that was juxtaposed alongside a story of, of, of repression, of suffering, of, of, of ultimately being crushed uh, and, and emerging, as you know, out of a uh, an industrial America that was uh, that was unsparing, uh, that that was brutal in a lot of ways, and that is in fact where the Wobblies uh, originated. Um, but they are unique. People remember them as different in, in part because they had a bigger idea of, of one big union, right? Can, can yes, this is an organization that uh, was founded in the summer of 1905. Uh, in Chicago by a diverse collection of, of unionists and radicals of different stripes uh, and, 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 and founded with a, a revolutionary purpose, um, with the aim of abolishing the wage labor system as its founders described industrial capitalism and replacing it with a worker's commonwealth. And they wanted to do this, the Wobblies did, at the same time that they wanted to organize the working class to better its conditions in a more immediate sense, uh, to improve wages and hours and working conditions in general, but ultimately uh, with the, the aim of bringing down capitalism. But we're talking about an era when businesses, when faced with organizing, would not typically shut down and move to another country or another city. They would bring in scab workers, replacement workers. Uh, and if everybody was in one big union, they couldn't do it, right? That's right. That was the aim. And in, in that respect, the Wobblies uh, had in mind uh, overcoming one of the main deficiencies of the labor movement as it existed in 1905, which was its failure to organize uh, most unskilled workers. Uh, the labor movement then was was heavily focused on skilled workers, and that left a lot of unskilled workers without union representation. But it also gave the capitalist a way of um, diluting the power of the working class, uh, particularly by adopting, as was the uh, the overall trend in that period, um, new technologies. Um, automated and mechanized means of production that weaken the power of skill workers anyway. And the Wobblies were aware of that among many other uh, characteristics of industrial capitalism. And they thought one way of overcoming uh, that advantage would be to organize the entire working class. And they meant without the racist divisions and sexist divisions and various other divisions that were part and parcel of the, of the, the, the owner's system and the, the general run of, of labor unions, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, the Wobblies um, opened their organization to all workers, regardless of race, regardless of sex, regardless of ethnicity, as well as, as skill. And in that regard, distinguished themselves from almost every institution in American life uh, in the early 20th century where discrimination and exclusion on the basis of things like ethnicity and race and, and gender or sex were not just common, they were, they were absolutely normal. And being a wobbly meant something to its members, I think, in at least many cases, more than probably any 
union today in terms of what it provided in terms of cultural resources and and in terms of the breadth of its mission uh, beyond the narrow focus of a particular union, right? Like a religion is how uh, the Wobblies themselves describe their commitment to this organization. And even that may, to an audience uh, nowadays, undersell the commitment that many of these people had to the organization, uh, because being religious back then uh, often had stronger connotations than it does now. And that was evident uh, in a lot of very salient ways, including in the way that the people who were persecuted for being members of the IWW endured uh, that persecution, um, adhered to their belief and their commitment to the union despite what was done to them. They, in, at times, likened themselves to uh, the, the old Christian martyrs even. And didn't name names and didn't cooperate and didn't go along in the way that perhaps some people did a few decades later when some of these same abuses were applied to, uh, to communists. That's right. Very few of them. Some, some did, but very few of them uh, rolled uh, when the opportunity was given of them uh, to testify against their fellow wobblies in these criminal cases, for instance, uh, to infiltrate the organization and spy on it. A few did, but very few did that. And, and what's even more remarkable is how few wobblies um, agreed to renounce the organization as a condition of leaving prison. So even when they were presented with the opportunity, look, you don't have to do anything. You just have to sign essentially these release papers that say, I'm no longer wobbly, I don't believe in what the wobblies believed in. If you do that, we'll let you out of prison. Uh, even when offered that, um, many, many, many wobblies, uh, dozens, scores of them, refused to do so. They said, we're not leaving. Um, prison under those terms. We're, we're committed to this organization. We did nothing wrong. We are in the right. And, and we won't renounce what this union stands for. So how many were they and why were they a threat that required new laws and new tactics and new unconstitutional abuses of power? So this was an interesting organization in a lot of ways, including uh, how many members it had and how that membership translated into the threat that you mentioned, this sense of threat, which was very much uh, a part of uh, the, 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 the processes that led to the persecution of this union. It was, uh, from one vantage, a relatively small organization at its, at its height, which happened to be the height of the period of repression that it endured in the late 19-teens. The union may have had uh, roughly 150,000 members at any given time. That was a fraction of the size of, um, of the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which was its, its, uh, its rival in the, the main industrial, I mean, I'm sorry, the main uh, labor federation in the United States at that time. But uh, those 150,000 members uh, counted for more than that simple comparison might suggest. For one thing, the union at that time was composed heavily of migratory workers, uh, people who passed in and out of membership in the organization as they roamed all over the country. And so in the late 19-teens, probably several times that number, several times 100, 150,000 members had been members of the organization, and most of them probably remained loyal to the union. And so it had uh, a kind of shadow membership that was a lot bigger than its dues paying membership. On top of that, the union had shown itself uh, quite capable of mobilizing workers who had never been members uh, in the course of, um, of labor disputes, of strikes that it, it, it took hold of. It had shown that earlier in its history. And for instance, in 1912, in a celebrated strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, uh, bread, the so-called Bread and Roses strike, and in some similar disputes. And so in, in those ways, the union had this membership that went beyond, or this support that went beyond its day-to-day um, its, its -day membership numbers. And you combine that with its revolutionary aims, and you had an organization that was to many powerful people in this country, quite threatening and worthy of being destroyed. 
and perhaps with the revolution in in Russia in 1917, people got even more scared. Uh, we're speaking with Ahmed White. The book is called Under the Iron Heel, The Wobblies and the Capitalist War on Radical Workers. Uh, so these people were arrested in large numbers, uh, often for the crime of criminal syndicalism. What the heck is that? Yes, yeah, so among the different crimes that Wobblies were prosecuted for, criminal syndicalism is in a lot of ways the most interesting because it was a crime that was invented to criminalize the industrial workers of the world. Uh, the first criminal syndicalism statute was enacted in Idaho in 1917 at the urging of mainly of some big timber capitalists who were, uh, who were upset with the union's uh, activism among their workers. What criminal syndicalism laws did was criminalize the advocacy of what was called industrial or political change by means of things like violence or sabotage or other crimes, and also to make it a crime to be an organization, uh, to be a member of an organization, I should say, that advocated that kind of revolutionary change. This was very clever because it allowed uh, states like Idaho and about 20 others followed suit to criminalize membership in the union without doing that in too explicit a way, without doing it in a way that the courts might declare unconstitutional. In other words, it avoided having to enact a law that said, if you're a member of the IWW, you're a criminal. That would have been unconstitutional. Uh, but this method of saying, we're going to make you a criminal if you belong to an organization that advocates this kind of change, uh, that the courts found satisfactory. And it was very effective in uh, criminalizing membership in the organization, not least because these wobblies were not, most of them, not about to deny their membership in the union. And it was very easy for prosecutors to convince credulous jurors, as you mentioned, at a time of upheaval, fear of Bolshevism and things like that and during the war. Uh, it was very easy for prosecutors to convince jurors that the union was, in fact, a dangerous organization. Yeah, it. I, I don't want to minimize the, the people were put in prison for significant periods of time and solitary confinement and abuse and torture. But I was also struck by how many got sentences of a year or two years or less, and how many people in later decades would get 10 times that for using drugs. Uh, I mean, prison sentences weren't what they would later become, right? No, they weren't. And in fact, what was very common back then uh, were so-called indeterminate sentences that were subject to uh, parole proceedings. Um, and in fact, parole was very common for all the sentences that these uh, IWWs or any other criminals, um, criminal convicts got back then. So uh, it was typical for, for instance, criminal syndicalism defendants to get sentences of one to 14 years uh, and to be out in two or three years time. If they were really trying to bring down the United States and destroy the world, it seems seems rather fair, uh, two or three years. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if that was indeed true. Uh, when in fact, I think the main purpose here was to undermine this union. And uh, the more immediate aim was to give these powerful industrialists relief from an organization that had proved quite vexatious to them. Yeah. What... Uh... Where was public opinion? I mean, juries could be swayed, but the union could grow. Did people uh, agree with these ideals or not? That is a very good question. And it's one that's difficult to answer because this played out kind of before the advent of modern surveying techniques of, of modern means of gathering uh, a sense of, uh, of where the public stood. As near as I can tell, uh, it depended. Uh, members of the working class, especially lesser skilled workers, uh, tended to sympathize with the union. Uh, the middle classes in this country and the wealthy did not. Um, it was kind of like that. And, and how did the Wobblies' uh, opposition, to their great credit, to World War I play into the, to their struggle for survival? Yeah, so this was an organization that had spent years 
uh, before the United States formally entered the war in the spring of 1917, condemning the First World War as a, as a senseless waste of workers' lives. And as the war, as, as it became evident that the United States would in fact enter the conflict and that this would cause the Union trouble, uh, its leaders began to debate the question, should they temper their views on this, uh, on this matter? And uh, to a considerable degree, the IWW did. Uh, but it wasn't enough. It was too little, too late. And uh, moreover, it's not as though the union ever supported the war. It didn't do that. It didn't do like other unions did or like uh, elements of the Socialist Party did and come out and support America's entry into the war. It just tempered its criticism of the war. And in that context, uh, the union remained quite vulnerable to being charged not only with being a dangerous seditious organization, uh, but being such a dangerous organization in a time of war. And this went a long way towards uh, justifying the repression that the IWW endured, uh, certainly during the war years. Because, because strikes could be depicted not as the struggle for a fair wage, but as sabotaging the holy effort of the war. Indeed, and this was the main premise of another major mechanism in in, in uh, undermining the union. And that was a series of federal prosecutions of IWW members beginning in 1917 that resulted in the imprisonment of about 160 uh, members of the organization, including most of its leaders. They were tried under the Espionage Act for conspiracy to undermine the war effort on exactly the premise that you alluded to, the idea being that their strikes and their acts of sabotage uh, undermine the war effort. There wasn't much to these claims, but it didn't matter, not least because they weren't charged with actually doing these things. They were charged with conspiring to do these things. And conspiracy is much easier to prove than an actual act of sabotage or interfering with the war effort. There, there, one incident that struck me, I mean, it's just a few sentences in a, a very long and rich book, but they, one of their songs is a parody of Onward Christian Soldiers that apparently the satire went flying over the heads of some legislators. And my heart just goes out to anyone using biting satire that goes over the heads of, of idiots, but maybe that's not good organizing in a world full of idiots. Uh, can, can you explain that incident? Yes, that's a that's a good a, a good point to raise. So this was when a state legislature was trying to adopt a criminal syndicalism law, and this this song was 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 trotted out to prove that these people were in fact uh, dangerous revolutionaries. And this kind of thing happened many times, including in criminal trials, where IWW speeches or songs or other uh, utterances by the union literature and that sort of thing was were mined for this kind of rhetoric. What's interesting is that, yes, uh, it was quite obvious that these kinds of things would redound to the detriment of the union in legislatures and, uh, and, and, in, and in, in court proceedings. And yet many in the organization not only persisted in uh, developing this kind of rhetoric and using it, but continued to embrace it. And I think what that reflected was um, a great measure of fatalism uh, on the part of many members of this organization uh, that comforted with this, this kind of sense of martyrdom uh, that ran through the IWW. Some of these people, it is fair to say, were eager to be persecuted, to be convicted, um, to be thrown in prison, not least because in their mind, this would prove something that uh, was a foundational belief in their organization, which is that the capitalist system and its legal and political order were inalterably opposed to them. And yet these imprisonments multiplied and ended up <laughs> end, putting an end to their whole movement rather than inspiring and, and uh, expanding it, right? That's right, and that's the paradox of this organization's history. Uh, that the one thing I think it unquestionably succeeded in doing was proving its founding assumption that it would be persecuted uh, and ultimately destroyed. 
No, I, I want to ask a question that will get me falsely accused of blaming the victims who were themselves falsely accused of many, many things, but I still want to ask it. What if the Wobblies hadn't had copies of books about sabotage lying around? What if they hadn't occasionally engaged in violence? What if they had publicly professed a deep commitment to nonviolence, like their deep commitment to the rights of workers? Would it have been harder to destroy them? It might have been. It might have been. I don't know that it would have made a great deal of difference in the end, though. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I think the primary impetus behind all this persecution was ultimately uh, the union's inroads uh, in organizing workers in industries uh, like agriculture, like construction and, 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 and lumber. Uh, and in so doing, in generating hostility from, again, these very influential uh, Western, mainly Western capitalists, uh, who were intent on destroying the organization. In other words, I think, I think the main factor in the union's destruction was alongside of these other forces, uh, but, but ultimately more significant than, uh, than those forces was the union success in organizing these workers. But the excuse used by prosecutors was your friend through rocks, you've got this book in your office. If those excuses hadn't been there, they simply would have invented some other excuses? I think they probably would have. And I, I think uh, one reason to believe that, I mean, an important reason to believe that uh, is to do with how often that was done to unions that were less radical in their aims than the IWW. I also think I, I might add that uh, the union's militancy, its militant methods were a big part of what happened to it and a, a, a big part of what justified the repression that it dealt with. So separate and apart from uh, its revolutionary aims was its uh, preoccupation with strikes, with what it caused, what it called um, uh, activism at the point of production. Uh, and, and that was very easily converted by the union's foes into something more than it was, something more threatening than it was. But that was kind of separate and apart from the union's revolutionary ambitions. What, uh, what lessons do you think workers or labor organizers or activists in general uh, should apply to today uh, from this history? I think even if you're not uh, a radical in the way that the IWWs were back then, even if you don't believe in toppling capitalism and destroying the wage labor system, even if you think this union was in a lot of ways um, reckless and, and maybe even irresponsible, and, and some people do think that, even if you reject the union on all of those grounds, there's a lesson here about uh, the state and about the importance of being cautious about making alliances with the state and seeking as, as unionists, as advocates for labor, seeking the protections of statutes, of administrative agencies, of the power of the state in general. Um, because what the Wobblies experience showed was that the state, even when it professes its support for workers, is not uh, insulated from, it's not free of class politics or the influence of powerful capitalists. And that in some ways was the Wobblies, uh, I think, legacy uh, and the lesson it left for more moderate unions. That and a lot of great songs, I think. Um... And, and a lot of great songs. And, and if you are a radical or a militant of any sort, there's a story here about courage, about perseverance, a very human one. Uh, that I try uh, my best to do justice to in the book, uh, that, that highlights what it means to be a radical, what it means to be committed to a cause. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's part of the legacy of this organization. I, I don't know if you saw uh, Ahmed White in the past few weeks, there was a graduation at Boston University and there was a Hollywood film studio owner making a speech. Uh, and of course, nobody had written him anything much worth saying because the writers are all on strike. But the students stood up and drowned him out and chanted, pay your writers, pay your... You don't see that kind of solidarity that often these days, do you? 
you, you don't and and uh and, and you and you haven't for for many decades now and and i think the kind of upsurges that you mentioned there of late uh might hearken at at at, at a change i i think maybe uh maybe things are beginning to change a little bit but for most of uh recent history in this country that kind of solidarity uh those kinds of expressions of solidarity were uh almost unheard of in america and it seems that the the IDWW was strong in parts of the United States where labor is the weakest now. I mean, where where did this thing grow, and what happened? That was one of the ironies of uh, of the unions uh, of the unions history that it rose not only in places like Kansas and and the Dakotas and um, and Idaho where you don't have today uh, a very strong labor. Movement, but it rose among workers uh, who are almost completely without union representation nowadays. Agricultural workers, uh, workers in, um, in 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 remote timber camps, um, workers who have who had very few skills, and workers who were again migratory uh, workers. Um, yes, the union in its day did something that we seldom see nowadays and that's to make inroads among those kinds of uh, those kinds of people and that isn't uh, something you see very much nowadays and it's uh, it might be regarded as an open challenge to labor organizers today to organize the unorganized as they used to say in the early 20th century the wobbly took on that challenge and they said that is precisely what we're going to do We've got less than two minutes left. Ahmed White, uh, the Supreme Court isn't much uh, in favor in most people's eyes these days, but it has a pretty ugly part of this story. I mean, it was till the year I was born, 1969, that it went on saying all these abuses were perfectly acceptable, right? That's right. There's a story here, too, about the courts and uh, about uh, liberal judges and justices, as much as conservatives, joining in this campaign, overseeing the prosecution of these wobblies, and then upholding their convictions on appeal. And for people who are nowadays uh, disappointed with, upset by uh, the antics of the courts, who have been awakened to the, to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the political biases of the courts, there's a uh, there's something in this story here as well, which is a reminder that this is the normal reality of courts, that the courts in this country's history have generally uh, been aligned with the powerful uh, against the less powerful. And that hostility has been perhaps the strongest when it comes, uh, when it came to workers. And the Wobbly story bears that out. <clears throat> All the more reason to get to work. Uh, the book is terrific. You should get a copy right now. It's called Under the Iron Heel. We didn't even talk about Jack London or where that title comes from. The, the Wobblies and the Capitalist War on Radical Workers. We've been speaking with the author, Ahmed White. Ahmed, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. I much appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.